it's good to, we're starting our series on the book of Romans today, and uh, I'm excited. I know a lot of our, some of our teens got to go to a dance last night at Rancho Cucamonga, and that's where Roy and Alicia are today. They were uh, in charge of the dance, so I think they finished around midnight, and they were cleaning up and everything this morning, so that's why they're, they're not with us. But uh, today, we're going to talk about the power of the gospel. And when I look around this park, it's a, it's a beautiful place, but for me, recently, it's been a source of uh, major pain, and for some others of us here, that we did a half marathon that ended right over here, right over there by those trees, like about three weeks ago. And I'll just say that the first half of it went really good. And the second half of it, I wasn't sure if I was walking or running, and I had to remind myself, oh, I still am running, even though I am, I'm, I'm barely running. And it was cool to do it with the guys, you know, Ted and, and uh, Cole and Kyle and a lot of bunch of other people did the 5K. And, you know, it's, it's been a while when I tried to get up after the race about four times, and I stood up for a few seconds, and I was like, you know, I don't feel so good. I think I might pass out right now. I think I'm going to sit down. So it was kind of like this process, and all the other guys are walking around and talking, and I'm just like, oh, I'll be with you in a minute. Uh, I'm not really quite ready yet. And uh, so finally we got up, and we went to breakfast, and we had a great breakfast, and after all this pain, we're, you know, we're enjoying breakfast, and by the end of the breakfast, about an hour and a half later, we all, I looked at, we all looked at each other, and we're like, I'll see you again next year, <laughs> and as I'm walking in my car, I'm like, what did I just do? I was dead, and now I want to do this again, and there's something about us as people that God, we, God gives us challenges and sometimes we get depressed and sometimes we crawl and sometimes we can't get up. But after a little while, we're like, okay, let's do it again. You know, he's given us that hope and desire and sometimes even a defiance. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do better. I'm going to do this thing again. I'm going to keep trying. And I believe that in a lot of ways, the book of Romans is that way, that he is writing to the Christians to continue to have hope and continue to keep trying, even when it is a challenge. And so let's pray as we get started. Father, thank you for this time. I pray that you use this time in your, in your word to inspire us, God. Bless all of our day. Help, you know, it's okay to look around and enjoy you, but I pray that your word will really... Help us to be inspired today by your power. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so my first point is the Son and the Savior. I'll start reading in verse 1. But we're going to talk about this, this power and this weakness and strength that comes together with Christ today. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son. As to his earthly life, he was a descendant of David, who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles like most of us to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. And an amazing beginning that he just gets right into it, and some of his other letters he says how great it is to see everyone, and says hello and some greetings, and here he gets into it right away. That I'm talking about Jesus, and he is the, the son of David, so to speak, but he's also the son of God. He is the son of God and our Savior. And in this time and place, this was a very radical, challenging statement. It was almost insurrectionist in its appeal. 
Because it's one thing to say that Jesus is Lord when you're, say, out in Ephesus, which would be Turkey thousands of miles from Rome, but it's another thing to say it in the middle of the capital of the world, where the Caesar is and all the soldiers are, and every day you're reminded as you walk through the temples and you just walk through and see idols on the streets, and you're reminded of this spiritual battle where in this world Jesus, uh, Caesar was Lord, but in our world Jesus is Lord. That even being a part of the family of God was a challenge. For us, that, that's pretty cool, right? We get to be close to other people. We get to all share the same God and the same faith. And we get to share with one another we need. And it's a great idea. And, and yet in Rome, the way that the society was set up is that Caesar was the father of the people. He wasn't just the emperor. He was the father. And so saying, just saying that you have the father in Christ was a rebellion against the fathership of Caesar. And for some of you who have seen the movie Gladiator, I guess they had they did their research there where he says he's the father of Rome. He looks at them like they're children. That's how they saw the society. You know, God has created a new worldwide family under Christ. And recently we've been reminded of some of the difficulties that our world has is facing as we hear news from the Ukraine. There's a Facebook page for some of you who are interested. It's called ICOC for Prayer for Peace for Ukraine. And every day they're giving updates and people praying together. And I heard about even the church leaders in Ukraine and Russia praying together every day for peace and for God's will to be done. And it's it's one thing to talk about having peace here and we're in the park and we get to hang out and play games and have a barbecue and they're sleeping in bunkers on cardboard boxes and talking about having peace in Christ. I pray that today that we can truly see the Son and Savior that is in Jesus. He talks about the power of the resurrection of the dead and so many times, and we're going to take communion at the end of, of our time here, but we talk about the cross of Christ and the pain of Christ and how sin put him up there, and we forget about the resurrection of Christ. And Paul begins with the, the resurrection of Christ, that Jesus died, but he also rose again. And in every situation where he mentions the, res, the crucifixion, he also mentions... The, the resurrection and that not just that is our hope for the end of our lives but that is for the middle of our lives that when we're hopeless that God provides hope when we're in despair he, he renews our souls when we're sick he provides health when we're lost he helps us to be found and that is my my challenge for you is when you feel despair to remember the resurrection and, and look for that hope that God wants you to have because this life without it is, is not very good and yet in every situation he promises that we have a, a solution an answer a hope in Jesus to put it a different way it's like talking about the Rams the LA Rams of old I know Chevy would get excited about that or not. My buddy here, he, he disavowed the Rams for about 15 years because they left. But if you mention the Rams of new with the Rams of old, it's a lot more exciting. And so many of us, we can go through life just focusing on the despair and forgetting about the faith and resurrection of Christ and the hope that God gives us. Paul is writing a letter from the position of someone whose life has been radically changed by this gospel, by the good news of Jesus, by his words and deeds and appearance to him personally. 
And today, many of us, we're here not just talking about the resurrection, but we are living a resurrection of sorts in our own life. And in this, we are reminded that we all need help. I don't know about you, but in my family, help was a bad word. It it is a four-letter word, but it really was. We didn't like to ask for help, and just about anything that we did, it was kind of a figure it out without YouTube, right? It's not that bad when you have YouTube and somebody's walking you through it, but it's basically figuring it out on your own. And to need help was to be weak. It was to be less than. It was to admit that you were inadequate. And that wasn't very fun. Even now, it, my, my, my heart cringes to say those words. And yet, in Christ, we're reminded that we all need help. That we can't do it ourselves in every area of our lives that ultimately we can't forgive ourselves. We can't carry our souls anywhere afterwards, but even in this life, to be human is to need help. And I think we're reminded in those moments when we're desperate and we pray and we come to that realization that we need help. My first year of college, I recognized that I needed help. On my first test, I got a D minus in chemistry. And on my first paper, I went to the writing center because I I figured I needed something. And the, the, the girl there, she asked me, what, so what's your thesis of this paper? And I just kind of looked back at her and I said, I don't really know what a thesis is. I just write until I get to the number of pages I need and then I stop. She wondered what the heck I was doing here in college. But that was kind of an obvious point where I realized I need help and I don't just need it on this one. I need it like all the way through. And I'm grateful that some of the Sisters helped me through, and I got to figure out what a thesis was by the end of my semester. But there's other things that we have that we don't realize that we need help. It's not quite as obvious. It's not blaring out. We, we want peace, and we search for peace, and a lot of times we don't realize that we can't give it to ourselves. That we take classes, we try to meditate, we try to figure things out, and those are all good things, but Jesus is saying, come to me and I will give you rest. And yet we still can't sleep, and we can't get along with people, and our frustration comes out on our loved ones, and we're wondering, where is this peace? And Jesus is raising his hand saying, "It's, it's over here. And yet, you have to ask for help from him. Sometimes in our relationships, we can do the same types of things where we we try to learn from one relationship after the next, and we learn a little bit here and a little bit there, and they still don't go well, and we keep repeating these patterns because we don't ask for help from Christ, from others who have figured out some things and sometimes God gets us desperate and we ask for help maybe right after a big breakup and then a week later we're we're kind of moved on and we forget that we don't know what we're doing in relationships or sometimes we lose hope we get depressed, we get down, we get discouraged, and it seems like we don't want to get out of bed and everything is bad. And this week was kind of that way a little bit. Thinking of friends over in, in Kiev, and our daughter was has a friend in school who has family members over there, and she was calling and not, not, not handling it really great, but just to recognize there's a lot more despair that needs a lot more than I can give. And yet hope comes from God. I pray that we recognize our help and we call out to the Son and to our Savior, Jesus. My second point, 
The righteous will live by faith. I'll start reading in verse 14. I'm going to skip kind of the middle part of the chapter. You can go read it, but it, it talks a lot about the love that they share with one another, how they encourage each other. There's a there's, they're praying for one another. There's a real connection, and I'm excited even today as we're in the park to be able to hang out with each other for more than just church. Sometimes we, we go to church and we go home and we do that over and over, but we don't get to kind of hang out. And so I'm excited. I want to encourage you to stick around and hang out. I'm sure that we brought way too much food than we ever could eat. So if you didn't bring food, you're good. Don't go get it. We brought six hamburgers for the two of us. So I'm like, I don't know why, but we just did. Okay, so I'm sure that I'll, there's a lot to go around. But I'll start reading verse 14. I'm obligated to both Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. Amen. That brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And I love this scripture. It's quoted a few different times in the Bible. It's one of those that goes through the entire Bible in Habakkuk 2 and Galatians 3.11 and Hebrews 10.38. You might not get all that, but just look up that those words. You'll find them. I love it because it's a simple verse. Sometimes I like simple things. The righteous will live by faith. What do I need to do? God wants me to, if I want to be in a right relationship with him, to live my life by faith. That's a good one to memorize when we're getting frustrated and flustered and worried. To, the righteous will live by faith. And trust in God. It's similar to those promises that fill the Bible, but I love it. It's so easy to, to remember. It'll change your life. If every time you're afraid, sad, or worried that you make a decision, I'm going to pray in that moment. Because we waste a lot of time worrying. And if you haven't noticed, we worry about the same thing over and over and over and over. It takes We worry for two hours, but it's really about one thing. And we get to the end of it and we realize, you know what? I didn't really pray about this at all. I thought about all the possible negative consequences that could happen, but I didn't pray. So next time you're afraid, worried, sad, pray in the moment at the time. And chances are you won't worry quite as long because you'll be giving it to God in the moment. Now, living by faith is not an easy proposition because I'm guessing that most of us here have a belief in Christ at some level. But to have a, a, a true trust and peace and confidence in Christ, to have our hope and security and safety in Christ is a different thing. I'll tell you a story here, and I keep trying to find a better story than this. So if you have one, I've been telling this story for a long time, but I can't quite find a better one. It's this guy named Charles Blondin. And many of you have heard this if you've gone to church for a while. But maybe it would be new to someone. In June, On June 30th of 1859, Charles Blondin decided, I am going to walk across the cable from one side of Niagara Falls to another. And they measured it out at 1,100 feet. This was a big, big deal back in the day. So 25,000 people showed up at Niagara Falls. They even have home movies that are out on YouTube. You can check it out to see what would happen. So he started going across and he made it slowly all the way across to the other side and people just went nuts they went crazy yes this is amazing so he came he came all the way back and he did it again and again not just once i mean it was like man this guy's got it down 
So then he, came, he said, this time I'm going to do it with a wheelbarrow. And he took a wheelbarrow, and there's no cables, no ropes, no nets, there's nothing. This is 1859, right? So if you fall, you're, you're done. Took the wheelbarrow, goes all the way across, all the way back. People are just cheering, going crazy. You're probably eating lunch while he's going across, I don't know. <laughs> Barbecuing. And then he comes back and he says, now I'm going to put rocks in my wheelbarrow. So he puts a bunch of rocks in there and he goes all the way over and all the way back. Everybody's cheering. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. This guy is incredible. I've never seen anything like it. And then he says, I could, how many of you believe I can do this with a person inside? Everybody's cheering. Oh my goodness, this is the most amazing. You're incredible. And he points at one man and he says, okay, get in. And he doesn't get in, right? He's like, I don't know, man. It's one thing to think about it. It's a nice concept, but I'm not going in there. You did it 10 times, but, you know, on the 11th time, it's going to happen. You know, it was so much like that with Jesus. That he did so many miracles way beyond walking across the tight rope, and yet... They still didn't believe. There's a big storm, and he goes walking on the water. I don't even know why he would think to walk on the water. But he says, oh, yeah, I'm just going to walk out in the water. And they're all holding on to the boats like, no way. I'm not getting out of here. And one of them just says, okay, I'll give it a shot. And they make it a few steps, and they fall in. And, you know, it's not as easy to live by faith as it is to hope by faith. He's at a place maybe similar to this where there's thousands of hungry people and he looks around and he says, okay, you feed them. And they start wondering, no, this isn't possible. I don't have enough money. This is my calculations and all these other things. This doesn't make sense. And then he feeds all of them. His friend Lazarus dies, and they bury him. And instead of going over to the him in his time of need, he allows him to die. And he goes a little bit later. He takes his time. And can you imagine being there? He says, okay, now I'm going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And everybody thinking, oh, man, this is going to be great. Okay, now you you remove the, the stone. Can you imagine being the person? Like, I don't know. I don't want to do that. Like, Family's probably not going to like it if I go over to their there and remove the stone here. But finally, they, they rolled it away, and we know what happened. In so many ways, God has given us storms, famines, and death, helping us to get into the wheelbarrow with him. To put ourselves fully in his, under his control. The only thing you can do in the wheelbarrow is try to stay as absolutely still as you could, right? I mean, that's the only thing you can really contribute to this endeavor. And maybe God is trying to help us to see, you know, if you could just try to stay still, I'm going to get you through this. That's all you can do. You can't control the wind. You can't control the waves. You can't control your health. You can't control who invades who. You can't control anything except sitting still in the wheelbarrow and letting God take us across. I don't know that there's many, when they get to heaven, that people are going to cheer because of how amazing we were. Right? We fall in the water. Maybe we take a couple steps on top every once in a while. But without Jesus pulling us up, there's no one that's going to be uh, feeling too great. And yet, when we get there, we're going to be praising him and cheering. Thank you for getting us across. Thank you for lifting us up. We're not going to be going, oh, wasn't that great? I am such a good person because I asked for help. And you helped me. Wasn't that great? 
Jesus, you are my Savior. The righteous will live by faith. That's all we can do is trust in Jesus and let him do the rest. Not that he doesn't call us to step out of the boat and to obey and those things, but ultimately the message of Romans is you can do all the things you want to do, but without me, it ain't going to work. Faith in me is where it is at. As we take communion and we remember the body and blood of Christ, we're simply putting our faith in the miracle that God has done. His death, his suffering, our sin that caused it to happen. We may even ref- you may even reflect on your week, and maybe you see it as a good week, or maybe you see it as a bad week. Maybe you were flying high, and maybe you were just crawling or sinking. Let us remember the resurrection with whatever it was. The hope and the renewal and the restoration and the power that we have with Christ. It is the power of God that brings salvation to all who believe. I pray that we can trust in him and know that he's got us right where he wants us to be. And he's not going to let us down. And that we remember those words, the righteous will live by faith. And when you're wondering what to do, that's a good place to start. And in a special way today to remember that we're sharing this Christ with those around the world. Let's remember those that are under oppression or the threat of oppression. Those that are on the news and those that are not on the news. And remember that we all share the same Christ and the same hope. Let's pray as we will take our communion. Father, we thank you for this time. Even speaking about you and speaking about faith, it is humbling to realize how, how short we can fall. But it is so amazing to know that you are there to pick us up at every step. Whether we are hurting today, whether we're depressed, whether we're worried, God, I pray that you meet us where we are and give us hope. Give us renewal. Give us faith. Give us a vision of of Christ, not just dying for our sins, but raising from the dead. And help us to live with that faith that whenever we think about his death, that we are confronted with his resurrection. I thank you for his body and blood that we celebrate that today. And thank you for that tomb that was never, was not used for very long as he was raised. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name.